Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, September 5th, 15th, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Catherine Blunt, reporter for the Wall Street Journal and author of California Burning, the fall of Pacific gas and electric and what it means for America's power grid. Meanwhile, rail companies and the unions representing rail workers have reportedly come to a tentative agreement ahead of the Friday deadline. We're yet to get the have the full details of that agreement, but hopefully it's good. In other union news, minor league baseball players whose pay and benefits have been disgustingly low are officially unionized. They voted to unionize as a part of the uh, Major League Baseball Players Association, so they'll have some protections, finally. A judge in Ohio has temporarily blocked the state's abortion ban. As in West Virginia, the state's only operating abortion clinic had to stop the procedure immediately following the passage of their own ban. Indiana's ban goes into effect today. Republicans reportedly want more time to whip votes on the marriage equality vote and religious liberty exemption that they're cooking up. How do I do my best Dr. Evil voice here? How about no? How about no? Another poll shows a sharp increase in Biden's approval ratings ahead of the midterms. The AP has him at 45%, up from 36% in, in July. Dark Brandon rising. Mark Meadows has complied with his DOJ subpoena related to January 6th. Ron DeSantis has reportedly flown dozen... Well, it's, it seems clear he did it at this point, but flown dozens of migrants to Martha's Vineyard and dropped them there without a plan for a political stunt. More on that in a bit. The Biden administration has transferred the $7 billion in Afghanistan's foreign reserves stolen from the Afghan people under the guise of 9-11 reconciliation to a trust fund in Switzerland. I, there are millions of Afghans starving right now. They could use that money. In Pakistan, over 33 million remain displaced and 1,500 have died due to disastrous floods. Just a reminder. And lastly, a former aide of Andrew Cuomo, Charlotte Bennett, has sued him. The second woman to do so out of the 11 who publicly came out with their stories. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's an Emma Jordy Report Thursday. We've got a great show for you, per usual. I always put a little bit of extra effort in when I'm hosting by myself, but don't tell Sam that. Um, he probably already knows. Uh, but um, a reminder, today at 4 p.m., Bradley and I are doing a little ESVN special where we give our picks for the NFL weekend, and we're moving the show, the real full show, to Mondays at 4 p.m. It just makes more sense with the NFL season. So we're looking forward to that. And hopefully we can touch on this uh, minor league unionization in, in the MLB because it's been a long fight. And um, Bernie Sanders weighed in on that months ago because of like just some of the egregiously low pay that these baseball players were were receiving. And the MLB, if you want to be a professional baseball player, you've got to come up through the minors. So they were able to choke down salaries and pay w- as they dangle the dream of being a professional baseball player in front of you. It's quite similar to what the NCAA does. It's 
yeah you, it, you're compelled to go through that funnel it's unbearably uh exploitative there are certain uh high drafted athletes who get uh, like a nice signing bonus when early on but for a l most of those guys it's not very much pay at all uh housing is not provided like you're moving all over hell because you might get called up called down and you're very much on your own and it it's it's crazy how I mean, shabby it is. My cousin's gone through this. Yeah. My cousin's gone through this. He's no longer in the minors. Um, he was in the Orioles system for a while. Got up to the pros a, a, a couple times, um, but for the majority of it was on Double A AA and Triple A. And it's crazy how he how, and I I don't know how a lot of those guys get through like that system. It's just like it's often like you're rooming with guys into your mid twenties. Like it, yeah. it's not the. Uh, it's it's just unequal uh, inequality in the system that needs to be levered out because those are the guys that fill the teams. Um, you don't have baseball without the minor leagues. Yep, and so ho thankfully they um, are now going to be included in the major league base major league baseball union, which has been flesh flesh fleshing its fleshing flexing its muscle um, recently in the, in the midst of the pandemic. So hopefully they can do that on behalf of the minor league players as well. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that dynamic works between the actual pros and uh, I mean the, um, big league pros and the minor leaguers. Uh, I'd love to see that when hopefully the G league starts to become a bit bigger in the NBA to circumvent the NCAA and maybe, you know, some of the players in the G league can, I'm not even sure what that labor situation is, but yeah, I'm not sure either. Like there needs to be a my, there needs to be a second tier of professional athletes, so they're not reliant with union protection, so they're not reliant on co the college system, which doesn't pay them anything, or an exploitative minor league system. But this is a good step in the right direction. On yeah, that and I would uh, you know take more money from ownerships uh, to give it to those sorts of players. But I also think you might need to have more revenue sharing among like the high paid athletes mm -hmm. and some of these lower paid athletes because it's really a shabby, shabby system when you actually look at it. And I really appreciate Bernie doing all he's done to uh, shine a light on it because it it's it, it might seem small because it's baseball, but it's really indicative of a lot of different dynamics in American economy. Let's turn, uh, with that said, to, to DeSantis' stun here, because around 50 migrants arrived yesterday afternoon on Martha's Vineyard, and they were dropped off. Officials were purposefully kept out of the loop so that a maximum amount of chaos could ensue for DeSantis' political stunt, which many people are saying is essentially human trafficking. Because that's really what it is. It's human trafficking for politics. Yeah. And these, you would think, right? This is the governor of Florida. Perhaps these migrants arrived in Florida. No, they originated and came over the border in San Antonio, in Texas. Um, and they've been flirting with this kind of stunt for a while. They finally pulled it off. This is the party that oh, their only operating principle is owning the libs and they're Martha's Vineyard is a liberal vacation destination, and there are more wealthy black people on Martha's Vineyard than there are in other uh, vacation destinations. So it's like the perfect, per the Obamas, the Clintons vacation there. It's the perfect uh, area for the Republicans to harp on um, and use for their own agenda. And it's a small island. There already are problems on that island with housing being incredibly unaffordable for the people that work there and live there full time because of the prices being driven up by se the purchase of secondary homes from wealthy people on this island. And so that's where they decided to drop uh, these migrants. And some of the stories of how they deceived people here are just jarring. Um, NPR spoke to a woman that identified herself as Perla and she said that she was approached outside of the shelter in where she was, was lured into boarding this plane by saying that there would be, they would be going to Boston where they would get expedited work papers and have food. That's how they trick them so for they their own political to. stunts. So they were lied to. I mean, some of them at least, at least Perla, uh, and she was... Uh, uh, she was recruiting passengers, other other uh, areas, saying like, "Look, the, this is where they're going to send us. They're going to provide us with expedited papers and food." They lied. I mean, despicable. It's just like the the, the 
as I mentioned too, the the island is quite small. Its houses shelter is uh, New York Times was saying it doesn't even operate in the summer and only has room for ten people. So they had to house them at the local high school in Martha's Vineyard. And like, I mean, what's also gross about this too is that DeSantis, they as I mentioned, they mostly seem to be from Venezuela. DeSantis is trying to not just drum up anti-communist and anti-socialist resentment with Cuban American voters in, in Florida, but he's also trying to sow racial uh, and cultural resentment between two groups because uh, the Venezuelan population in Florida has grown rapidly in particular, and I think half of Venezuelan Ameri- uh, Venezuelans in the United States live in Florida. So this is just like a part of his divide and conquer Republican strategy. It's, it's tried and true. Um, but, you know, he really is throwing out all of his bags of tricks in the preseason ahead of his eventual run for president. My opinion is that it's, I don't know how much this can sustain itself, given how he's emptying the clip, so to speak. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's really disgusting to play with people's lives like this. And uh, on Jesse Waters' show yesterday... He had Mike Pompeo on, and they were receiving word of this incredible, incredible stunt by Ron. Um, Here's Mike Pompeo's response in real time. I don't know if you've seen the video, but DeSantis has sent migrants on a plane to Martha's Vineyard. Now, this is where the Obamas have a home, Oprah, Beyonce, even James Taylor, who's going to be seeing fire, rain and migrants. Uh, not to mention Rosie O'Donnell. I mean, everybody Hilarious. basically that you know on the left has a home there. Do you think they're going to be embracing their new neighbors? <laughs> you know, these are all sanctuary cities until they're in their sanctuary. Right. I, I doubt they'll embrace them. Don't know that I've ever been to Martha's Vineyard. Uh, I've been to places where we've seen these migrants come across. This is not good for America. Uh, every town's a border town, and we need to make sure we get mm. our southern border secured exactly like we did for four years, Jesse. All right, Mike Pompeo, thanks so much for joining us on Primetime. Great to be with you, sir. Um, every town is a border town. By definition, dude, that's, uh, that's not really the case. It's an island. It's in the middle of water, so it's surrounded by water. Just a bit of a geography lesson. Um, I mean, the glee that they exhibit there is just typical villainy stuff. But Carrie Lake was also uh, on, on Fox News yesterday... Tucker Carlson had her on and um, essentially asked her how she felt about this particular stunt. Do we have that, Bradley, the Carrie Lake clip? Yeah, yeah. Um, Here she is responding uh, because she's running for governor in Arizona. And this is her take and different flavor. uh, the, The different flavor of her take in terms of like just the politics of her being in Arizona as opposed to what DeSantis is trying to do in Florida. Sure. I just have to throw this at you. And because you live in a border state that has borne the brunt of the lawlessness on our border, we've just received digital footage of illegal aliens being dropped off in Martha's Vineyard. Apparently, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, flew them there on the idea that communities, border towns in Texas and Arizona are bearing all the brunt. And maybe the people who make these policies should have to live with them. What's your view of this? You know, I actually, I get a kick out of it watching these liberal mayors just, you know, throw their hands up and say we can't handle it because it's life every day for us in these border states. However, I'm not a fan of it, Tucker. I mean, we're just taking people here illegally who shouldn't be here. We're moving them further inland. My plan is the most bold, aggressive plan on the border. We're going to secure the border. We're going to call it what it is, issue a declaration of invasion on day one, get troops on the border in the form of our National Guard. We're going to stop people from from coming over and we're going to stop the the cartels from having control of our border I don't like it as a mother and I know no Arizonan likes it that we are the pipeline for the most dangerous deadly drug this country's ever seen called fentanyl yeah, well, I, what, no I mean I just they are pivoting to fentanyls b- being brought over the border by migrants when uh, I don't know if people realize who initially manufactured fentanyl, but that, ha- that was, that's the corporations that uh, created this drug and knew that some of these drugs were incredibly addictive 
And now it's being manufactured in other countries and in basements because people are able to do it cheaply and it's more easy to hide and you don't need full poppy fields like heroin. But that's beside the point there. I mean, it just... Well, like, I mean, they, these people support um, or work for the types of like Purdue Pharma companies and uh, sh shutting down any sort of influx of fentanyl over the border is just helping... Uh, uh, save them from competition basically oh. <laughs> yeah it, it's a good point but um i mean the thing about this is that the reason that desantis hid this from local officials was in order to create as much chaos as possible for a political stunt they don't have anything except for owning the libs and like the the visceral reaction that that creates in their base as a motivating principle for what for for DeSantis politically. And I mean, for me, I, I've now been just getting this slow sense that he's peaking a bit too early. Like, man, may, maybe save your human trafficking for a little bit later in the primary process, Ron, if you really want to make a cost make, like 12 million dollars for that little stunt. Yeah, I mean, it, so uh, that's that. But um, I'm hoping that some of these migrants are able to settle because a lot of times, m great majority of the time when people are coming over the border, they are trying to connect with a family member or somebody who already lives here in the United States. So essentially kidnapping people and shipping them to an island on another part of the country is not just cruel, it's family separation, but I guess that's the point, is it not? All right, with that said, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are going to be joined by Catherine Blunt, author of California Burning, The Fall of Pacific Gas and Electric and What It Means for America's Power Grid. We'll be right back. back and we are joined uh, now by Catherine Blunt, reporter for the Wall Street Journal and author of California Burning, the Fall of Pacific Gas and Electric and what it means for America's power grid. Uh, Catherine, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for, thanks having, for having me. Of course. So um, PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, for, for people who might uh, be on the East Coast, might not be in this country listening to this, what is PG&E and, and what does it provide as a service um, and how many people does it service? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the, the, um, the primary public service 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 to California. Service service territory, thousand thousand miles. It delivers power to millions of homes, homes, businesses, um, all the other region. region. Gotcha. Um, all right, we might have to take a, a quick break, really quick, just to fix some audio issues, really quickly. Um, okay, sorry. Maybe better. Um, sorry, Catherine. Do you mind saying that one more time? Uh, what PG&E is? I apologize. 
No problem. PG&E is the primary utility company serving most of um, Northern and Central California. It serves to cover 70,000 square miles, which is an area larger than New England, serves um, millions of homes and businesses throughout the region. Gotcha. So you did investigative work on PG&E and really back from its inception. Um, People might remember, though, them more recently and more notoriously for um, pleading guilty to the wildfire that it caused uh, back in 2018. And it's, it's quite rare that a company of this size and corporations in general are pleading guilty for manslaughter. And that's exactly what happened, right? That is, I mean, it's, it's extremely uncommon. So the, the fire in question ignited in November of 2018, when one of the company's high voltage transmission lines failed and ignited a fire that destroyed the town of Paradise in Northern California and other nearby towns, 84 people died. And um, an investigation revealed that they had been operating the transmission system in that area with reckless negligence. And ultimately the company pleaded guilty to 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter for each of the deaths. That that is that is shocking and jarring. And I mean, how how did their negligence cause that wildfire in 2018? So the specific uh, what happened specifically was that there was a a hook that um, was holding aloft a high voltage wire, and that hook uh, broke nearly in half during a windstorm on the morning of November 8th, dropping the wire. Um, an arc of electricity surged from the wire, and sparks settled on the dry brush beneath the tower. And it, uh, the investigation revealed this particular hook had been hanging there in the tower for nearly 100 years. It was um, installed around 1919 and ni- or 1920 when the line was first built. And the company, over the course of uh, you know maybe the 20 years prior to the fire, had reduced the frequency and thoroughness of its inspections. And so sometimes perhaps inspectors would walk beneath the line or sometimes fly it by helicopter. But it turned out that those um, inspection practices weren't sufficient to uh, evaluate the tiny pieces of hardware holding the wires to their towers. And pg e didn't detect the problem um, after, after during the, you know, the entire time that this hook was hanging there until it ultimately wore down to the point of breaking. So in, in terms of uh, what the state was allowing for or regulating in this instance like were they in violation of any state regulations because they were not properly inspecting these lines and hooks that were a hundred years old yeah state regulations as it relates to transmission line inspection and maintenance are a bit vague so it's unclear as to whether they were in direct violation of any very specific regulations but regulations do state very clearly that the company uh, has to operate, you know, to the best of its ability to keep the system safe. And in this case, you know, the, the reckless negligence finding um, indicated that, I mean, pg e knew that there were risks and and it also knew that it wasn't doing enough to to mitigate them, um, especially as, as wildfire risk increased. So the fact that they were not doing appropriate inspections, did that sa- save uh, cut costs for them? Did that save them money? Because I know that they had some ambitious goals in terms of shareholder value that might have been undercut by, I don't know, the manpower of doing inspections uh, for a cent- century old equipment as it services uh, millions and millions of people. Right. So when we think about um, investor owned utility companies which provide the majority of our electricity across the country, um, it's the, a kind of a basic principle to understand is that they make an authorized rate of return or an authorized profit, essentially on large capital investments that improve the overall value of their systems. They do not make money on day-to-day operations and maintenance activities, such as inspections or replacing tiny pieces of equipment like the hooks we were talking about. Those are treated as expenses on which they do not earn a return. And so good financial operators are often um, good at minimizing expenses and and freeing up that money to invest uh, as, uh, you know, in um, capital improvements. And theoretically, a company can strike this balance without compromising safety. But PG&E, over the course of the last 20 years, prior to the the large fire, did this very poorly. And it was working to minimize expenses for a number of reasons, um, in part for financial performance reasons. And uh, so some of the pressure that we saw on the, um, you know, transmission expenses, transmission inspections, maintenance, 
were reduced as a result of that. To me, uh, what this screams, and uh, I think we've been saying this on the show for a while, is utilities of this nature, the fact that the, having a profit incentive for that is, uh, I mean, I think incredibly problematic and in incongruent, incongruous with uh, the goals of what a utility should essentially be providing for people. And I, it's especially highlighted due to the recent events and the... Uh, the effects that climate change is is having on the country and on the globe right now. Yeah, so this is definitely becoming, you know, this this conversation is coming to the forefront in a way that I don't think we've seen historically because of what you're saying. We're seeing more strain on the electric grid. We're seeing greater challenges with, with reliability, uh, greater challenges with affordability, certainly right now in this inflationary environment. The argument for the investor-owned utility and having the profit motive is that this is a capital-intensive business and allows the companies greater access to capital markets. That's that's the argument. But it does create this inherent tension between private interests and the public good in terms of safety expenses and activities. It can. And so, you know, like I said, I mean, in theory, a company can strike this balance, but utility, excuse me, pg and &E did not strike it especially well prior to the 2018 fire and also a series of fires in 2017. And it's not the only company that hasn't done well in that regard. Um, and I think that certainly, as we're seeing now with the greater strain on the grid, as a, you know climate change, more severe weather, if a utility company has a history of mismanaging spending or mismanaging risk, you know the um, rising to, to confront these new risks is going to become more challenging and the consequences are becoming greater. Well, I, it's just, I mean, we saw this with Texas recently and how their grid was uh, uh, both not um, subject to traditional federal regulations and also uh, price gouging, which I, there's a, a susceptibility for that when these companies are primarily invested in profit. And I, I, under, like, I understand what you're saying about it allowing for some... Uh, flexibility because it's capital intensive but in theory the state could provide some of these uh some of this investment and hopefully you know that could cut down on some of some of what we're seeing here yeah so in the case of texas that was a, a bit of a different situation texas has a unique a uniquely competitive power market in which you know the utility companies aren't the ones that own the power generators those are owned by competitive power companies. And one of the problems in Texas was that these power generators were not, hadn't invested in their power plants to run in sub-freezing temperatures um, because it was such a rare event in Texas. And, you know, they're rewarded only for the power they sell. So, you know, keeping expenses low in that regard is, is um, I mean, there, there is a profit motive there as well. Slightly different. But then, of course, like, there is a conversation of state ownership of PG&E uh, after the 2018 fires, naturally, and, you know, removing the, the profit motive may solve some problems, but it doesn't solve others in terms of just, you know, how do you manage this aging infrastructure in a service territory that's becoming so much riskier as a result of drought and climate change? And then there's a certain liability construct that in California that a utility under any sort of ownership is liable for damages that its fires ignite. So then, you know, those liability costs then fall to taxpayers, not necessarily, I mean, there's... There's, there's a lot to be managed under any ownership structure, I think is. Yeah, so that is that is that sounds unique, though, in terms of how California framed that. Do you mind fleshing out that point? Sure. So there's a, um, a constitutional provision in California in which utility companies are liable for any damages resulting from fires that their power lines ignite, regardless of whether they were negligent. And this applies to both, um, you know, originally it applied to you know, municipal utilities or utilities owned by some sort of governmental agency. Um, and in the 1990s was expanded to include privately owned utilities because it was determined that they were substantially similar to their publicly owned counterparts. And actually, you know, you're beginning to see this idea debated in other parts of the West as wildfire risk increases. So what once was somewhat confined to California may have you know, implications throughout the region. So this was broad uh, electricity deregulation in the middle of the 90s. Like, what did that entail and what brought that on? Uh, what what caused, I mean, was it just like an embrace of neoliberalism more broadly or were there heavy lobbying efforts on behalf of some of these industries? Right. So, you know, interestingly, the utility industry was 
you know, somewhat supportive of deregulation, but also a bit ambivalent because what it meant was they would no longer be. Um, so when we talk about deregulation, I think it's a bit of a misnomer because the utility industry is, is heavily regulated and, and necessarily has to be. Um, deregulation specifically was the effort to create a competitive market for power plant operators. So as a result of and the reasons why this came about was electricity prices had been steadily rising for a number of reasons um, in the, you know, the 1970s and, and 80s, in part because of overspending on, on nuclear plants as some of these first plants came about, um, other reasons too. And so it, the idea was to have competition among power producers would drive down prices. And so California was one of the first states to undertake this in earnest. Each of the state's large utilities sold off most of their power plants to these competitive producers who um, were expected to sell power into the, a new market. And in the early 2000s, as a result of supply scarcity related to um, drought and high temperatures and other things, as well as um, a particular aspect of the market design that allowed for manipulation, um, wholesale power prices ended up being much higher than anticipated and drove pg e into bankruptcy for the first time. And they've had multiple bankruptcies and multiple uh, fires that resulted from uh, their lines and, and I guess their lack of uh, oversight of, of their own infrastructure uh, or lacking in appropriate um, inspections. Can you talk about some of those other incidents as well? Right. So um, one of the first major safety incidents or disasters that pg e had was in 2010, a natural gas transmission pipeline exploded in San Bruno, which is just south of San Francisco. Eight people died. It destroyed a neighborhood. It resulted in a, you know, a very long and detailed federal investigation as to how it managed that infrastructure. The company was ultimately convicted on um, several counts of violating federal pipeline safety laws. And then after, um, you know, in, in, around this time, you know, it's interesting to consider how quickly the risk profile of its service territory changed. You know, California was consumed by several periods of very severe drought. Tens of millions of trees died, making the consequence of a single spark much higher. And you're also beginning to see, you know, more power line failure throughout pg and service territory. There was a significant fire in 2015 that killed two people. And then in October of 2017, its power lines ignited um, just shy of 20 fires as branches got entangled with live wires. And then, you know, a year later in November of 2018 was the deadly campfire that killed 84 people. That as a result of all these fires, the company incurred about $30 billion in liability costs and sought bankruptcy for the second, bankruptcy protection for the second time. And, and just this is a, uh, a confluence of two major issues here, which is these old uh, lines that have not been properly inspected and an increase in dry brush and trees and uh, basically tinder for these wildfires due to climate change. So those two factors, would you say that that is what is cr that that created some of this crisis that you tracked and probably is going to in other areas of the country replicate itself uh, more times than not? Absolutely. I mean, there's the confluence of those two risks. I mean, wildfire risk is increasing throughout not just California, but throughout the West as a result of, you know, these very severe periods of drought and heat that we're seeing exacerbated by climate change. And, um, you know, it's not just California that has old infrastructure that needs to be managed differently in this new era or, you know, replaced in, in some cases. The grid across the country is very old. So you have, I mean, because of that, it's becoming more prone to failure. You layer on these new severe weather um, events, you know, you, the, 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 risk is, the risk is mounting, certainly. So um, can you talk a bit about PNG's history as a monopoly in that area of the country? Because it, it wasn't always um, basically the, the only provider there. Um, they merged in the 30s. What, how did that come to be and, and how did PG&E kind of dominate uh, California to the, to the extent that it did, you know, uh, today? Yeah, PG&E has a long history in California. It, you know, it formed as a result of, you know, the mergers and acquisitions among a lot of different little power companies that were cropping up to serve different parts of the state at the turn of the 20th century, um, in, in part because, you know, these companies recognized 
the vast hydropower throughout the Sierra foothills and built infrastructure to harness that. The company only had one real competitor in its lifetime, and that was Great Western Power, um, which was working to build a large transmission system to capture the hydropower in the Sierra foothills and bring it to San Francisco where the population was growing. Um, the two companies competed for a while and ultimately merged in 1930, creating the Northern California monopoly that we know today. Um, interestingly, the power line that failed and ignited the campfire was actually uh, Great Western Infrastructure, built around 1919. So the company, PG&E, acquired it as a result of this 1930 merger and you know, over time really lost track of the origin story there. When it, when it failed, the company really didn't know exactly how old it was, uh, specifically didn't know the exact age of the hook that broke, um, didn't have much record of it. And it's, uh, it is interesting to consider that it did last 100 years. But yeah, wow, it just, uh, it's, a, it's a great lens through which to understand the history. And, and in terms of the, the uh, cost cutting for the inspections, like in, in your, uh, I, I believe that you talked about this PowerPoint in particular, where there was um, mention of we need to increase shareholder value by some percentage point. And there was a lot more wiggle room in terms of safety inspections from a corporate perspective. Was that jarring in your research and um, compared to other maybe sectors that you have reported on the Wall Street Journal? Was that something unique? Um, so I think the company's really close focus on um, growing earnings growth really happened after it emerged from its first bankruptcy. A new CEO took over and implemented a strategy in which you know 8% um, annual growth in earnings per share was, was sort of gospel, so to speak. And it turned out as a result of this really close focus on earnings, expense, it, there was a lot of expense pressure that manifested in different divisions, and it was particularly acute in gas transmission. And then of course, you know, a gas transmission pipeline exploded. You can't draw a straight line between the expense cuts and what happened, but it did prompt this investigation that found that that you know, department had been underfunded and was forced to resort to less effective inspection methods. I think after that, the company's focus on earnings growth wasn't quite so you know, concrete or acute, but it was still certainly an important part of the company's strategy. and. There's another element of this that's a bit ironic. So after emerging from the first bankruptcy, California began, after PG and emerged from its first bankruptcy, California began setting some very ambitious renewable energy targets um, you know, in pursuit of carbon reduction goals. And the PG and E as well as the state's other utilities were required to contract for large amounts of wind and solar power, which at the time were much more expensive than they are today. So they were signing, you know, I mean, collectively, they were spending billions of dollars in procuring this wind and solar power which added to expense pressure over time. And I think it's also one of the reasons why you saw there be there's certain expense pressures within electric transmission years later. Um, and, and lastly, I guess, um, in, well, last section of this conversation, I'm curious about your take uh, on the Biden infrastructure package and how that might be able to combat some of some of the lack of resiliency in our grids uh, throughout the country. Like there are two, you know, there's the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, piece, but there's also the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was agreed to before. And um, my hope is that what the infrastructure that's going to be built will have some of, contain some of this resiliency. But, you know, I'm not the expert. That's you. So uh, wondering what your, your thoughts were. Yeah, so both the the so that one of the big provisions of the bipartisan infrastructure bill is it uh, increases um, federal involvement in helping to build new transmission lines to support wind and solar development, clean energy development across the country, and the um, the most recent climate bill also has a lot of money meant to accelerate the um, build out of new clean generation. And so I think the biggest impacts of these two pieces of legislation is that it will. Um, speed the energy trend. It's, it, they, it aims to speed the energy transition and bringing clean supplies online. It remains to be seen what can be done specifically as it relates to sort of the risks that older infrastructure poses. You know, managing you know just the the risk of failure there, coupled with the new risks of climate change, 
I'm sure there are some provisions that can help in that regard, but it, it seems to me that this is really more of a question of, of new clean supplies. All right. Well, uh, can't thank you enough for your time today. Uh, Catherine Blunt, reporter for The Wall Street Journal and author of California Burning, The Fall of Pacific Gas and Electric and What It Means for America's Power Grid. Thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate it. I appreciate it. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will be talking a bit about uh, Lindsey Graham's abortion debacle. We are back. We are back. Um, let's talk a bit about abortion, because as I mentioned at the start of the show, a few different abortion bans are uh, in flux right now, but a majority of them in these red states are going to stay. Uh, a judge in Ohio temporarily blocked the state's abortion ban, but that will probably get appealed and uh, it will get implemented most likely. In West Virginia, um, it the on Tuesday the bill was implemented and the state's only abortion facility had to stop the the procedure right away and that caused chaos in terms of future appointments um, and I, I'm sure there were a lot of people who could get pregnant who were trying to get in at the end of the wire uh, at, right before the wire I should say and. Um, the, that, that caused chaos. And Indiana's ban goes into effect today. But Republicans on the federal level are terrified of this issue galvanizing voters in the fall because for the first few months of this year, they were riding high on Biden uh, declining approval ratings and inability to pass uh, a major bill through reconciliation, which was eventually whittled down into the Inflation Reduction Act, which still does help combat climate change. So once that passed, plus Biden's student debt relief, plus inflation going down, Biden's approval rating has shot up from something in the like in the mid to low 30s in July to now he's in the mid 40s, which is a significant increase. And so they don't want the issues that made him and, and abortion in particular that brought him back into like the, the Democrats at the very least back into a more favorable position to 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 percolate and to remain remain on uh, the voters minds. And so that's why the uh, introduction of a federal, abortion ban by Lindsey Graham that would cap it at 15 weeks and then there would be some sort of legal panel and you would have to involve a lawyer if say your fetus did not have a skull say your fetus had uh, had health problems say the life of the mother was endangered you'd have to involve the law from a federal level in order to get a, a, an abortion which is just not how healthcare works um, and so Lindsey Graham has reminded everybody that, hey, actually, Republicans have been lying to you the entire time on abortion. They lied to you in the confirmation hearings of Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. When those Supreme Court justices said Roe is settled law and we're not going to touch it. And the Republican senators who sat in front of those judicial nominees as they answered those questions knew they were lying about it, too. You have to lie to get what you want. 
to the you have to lie and hide the ball because abortion is so popular and abortion rights are so popular in this country maybe not abortion in and of itself but women having the choice to do what they want with their own health decisions is popular in this country and the stripping of that is so unpopular that you have to make sure you lie and hide your religious extremism right up until the point when you strike. And that's what happened with Roe and the multi-decade buildup to that. They finally got what they wanted. And now they've caught the car, as Sam would say, and Lindsey Graham is blowing it all up as things were starting to at least fade a bit into the background for Republicans and saying, actually, we were lying to you on, on another level. We said the whole time that this was states' rights, but I'm going to preemptively tell the truth and tell you that we want a federal ban as well. And that's the problem that Republicans have with what Lindsey Graham has done here. It's not that he, the, the substance of the legislation is not what they're upset about. It's the timing. And here's Jesse Waters basically saying that to Lindsey Graham's face. China and North Korea are two to seven. We all agree on that. Well, now, though. wait a minute. Now, listen, I'm not going to sit on the sidelines and let America become that kind of nation. No one's saying you need to sit on the sidelines, but yesterday wasn't the day to do that. Yesterday There's, was the day they <laughs> lost all momentum when this inflation thing punched them right in the face and you gave them an out. A lot of uh, people don't like that. You could have well, done it on any other day, yeah. just like you could have delayed the whole press conference, like <laughs> Joe should have delayed that stupid party. Uh, so I, I take issue. I don't, think, I don't think there's a bad day to stand up for the unborn. What am I trying to say? That America needs to have a policy that makes us a civilized nation. It would bother me that if a baby's aborted at 38 weeks in California, New York, what am I proposing for our country? That at 15 weeks, when the baby can feel pain, you provide anesthesia to save its life. If you operate on it, it should be protected from being dismembered by an abortionist. That puts us in line with France, Germany, Great Britain. They all have abortion bans below 15 I weeks. understand. So, and the people well, are with you on that. No, I'm you're right. I'm not going to apologize. You're, you're right. No. Ever apologize I got about you. standing up I got for the you. unborn. It's, and you know what? It's, we need it's to go not, on the offensive here. It's not what's in your heart. Americans agree with that. They're against abortion no. after the first trimester. But there, you got to talk tactics, Senator. It's terrible timing, terrible tactics. We could have shoved this down their throat on the day the Americans got hammered with this inflation number and the market crashing. And now all the media and the Democrats are talking about federal abortion ban, federal abortion ban. You know, that's not smart well, politics, they're right? They're Again, there's one, they're lying about the nature of of the popularity of lindsey graham's bill like yes well they all have to lie about that like if you acknowledged how uh the the reality of popular and polling about abortion here like they should all just hang it up the, but i that's why i wonder why they even they even go there but they, they split the baby um by saying that most Amer americans are not favor in favor of abortions after 15 weeks when if a pollster is asking that question they're not giving the context that 90 percent of abortions in this country happen before the 15 week period when and the, like if the if you further ask like do you think that like say republican politicians should be uh, in that chain of uh, decision making i bet you that they would say no i think that should be up to the doctors and the women that's that's borne out and um the they also people understand implicitly given the fact that republicans have lied up until the point where they've overturned women's health care rights that they will lie again lindsey graham understands that this abortion restriction slash ban is not going to pass because the democrats have the house and there's a democratic president right now who could just veto it he's floating this as a trial balloon for a full ban on abortion and he also just wanted to center himself and miscalculate it that's the thing Lindsey Graham is just like constantly in a state of desperation to be taken seriously by Republican leadership. And you can see the pain in his face through that smile because Mitch McConnell is pissed off right now at Lindsey Graham. And Jesse Waters just told him what every other piece of person in Republican leadership has been saying behind the scenes. Like, don't be so clear about our agenda. It's the same thing with Rick Scott. Strategic ambiguity. Stop telling people in the text of your tax policy 
as you like try to run for higher office that you want to cut taxes for the wealthy and increase them on the poor and middle class. Don't just like say that outright. We've got to have Frank Luntz poll test it first, right? It's not global warming, it's climate change. It's not the estate tax, it's the death tax. We need to find a way to actually lie before we implement our policies. That's, that's, Republicans, that's Republican 101. And Lindsey Graham just went out and said it. And it's, he really gave these Democrats running in some of these more competitive races a, an excellent point in their case against other Republicans. Whenever they say states' rights, you just point to Lindsey Graham. Whenever they say this is a states' rights issue, how about the senator from South Carolina who's trying to ban it after 15 weeks and says, hey, we'll, we'll debate the amendments about who's going to make the determination about the post 15 week pregnancy or er, abortion decision. But I mean, hey, and I, I, I we said it on the show yesterday. Have those debates. I want to hear what Tommy Tuberville thinks about who should be making the decision post 15 weeks. Like what create what creative thoughts they just have in their mind about who should be making that choice. Because as I say, it's unpopular. Thank you, Lindsey Graham, for that. And yeah. and Waters knows it too. You don't want to be specific about this. This is why how Trump won in 2016 by saying everything on all sorts of issues. Like there should be some sort of punishment instead of abortion. But also like I think backtracked about that, and then people didn't trust him because he probably paid for abortions and stuff like that. Um, but uh, oh crap, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh yeah, I just want to remind folks. Um, that uh he also won by running as a moderate and so like this uh, Trump he also was, said i'm going to give everybody health care yeah, yeah he would exactly he was like we can't let people die in the streets and harry enton the like sort of nate silver adjacent guy said that trump was seen as the most moderate gop uh candidate since 1972 yeah i mean and because he wasn't explicitly religiously fundamentalist and that that he just told people what they wanted the to hear on different yeah on different through different media <laughs> because like the religious fundamentalism element is unpopular yet people don't like that people didn't like that mitt i mean mitt romney doesn't drink coffee and <laughs> only drinks milk or something like that like he won't have a glass of wine and he won't even drink coffee i mean what but, but my point is just the people don't want theocracy outside of the republican base um and so you still you have to walk a tightrope of appealing to those people and what that was for decades was hiding the fact that they wanted to ban abortion on the federal level. And they're still trying to do that with the states' rights argument until you have someone like Lindsey Graham just saying it. And so, hey, thank you, Lindsey Graham. Back in the public consciousness. Much appreciated. And I hope he sticks to his guns on this. Let's have debates on the floor of the Senate about abortion bans. Let's do it. I want to hear from everyone every one of the Republican senators about what their thoughts are. All right, folks, we are going to wrap up the first hour, the free part of this program now. But first, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea and chocolate. Use the coupon code majority. Get 15% off your order. You can get the majority report blend. You can get tea. You can get the cold brew blend, which I have I have partaken in and it's very very good i like that a lot check that out um also become a member support this program we'd really appreciate it you get access to the fun half which we are about to head into but first matt what is happening on left reckoning uh yeah left reckoning for left reckoning patrons this weekend we're talking to uh, my buddy thomas kennedy about florida we're going to talk about desantis rick scott maybe some other stuff um uh, get a little Florida update next week. We're talking to GP Jacob about Minneapolis, but patreon.com says left reckoning to support the show. Also, we have a live show at, uh, October 23rd at the Terragram ballroom in Los Angeles. So if you're in LA, uh, make me happy and go uh, buy your tickets, uh, to that uh, Terragram ballroom. Oh yeah. Damn. When do you leave for that? Uh, I think I'm gonna leave on Saturday. Oh, nice. All right. It's a Sunday uh, evening show. That'll be fun. That'll be fun. Um, all right, and for me, check out ESPN today at 4 p.m. Um, we're moving, as I mentioned, the show to Mondays. Just makes more sense with the schedule. Plus, like, as the election ramps up, Tuesdays are kind of a big day. 
big day in the election uh, political world. So we're going to be on Mondays at 4 p.m. for the real show going forward. But the bonus show will be on Thursday, same time, where Bradley and I will be making our picks for the weekend. Um, I don't know if I can maintain my 3-0 and start because usually I'm bad on week one, given like the fact that I don't have a good feel of the teams, but I guess I got a little bit lucky. Um, so check that out. See if, uh, see if Bradley can make a comeback this week. Can you want to tip your hand about what you're thinking? Might involve my, my, it might involve one of the two New York teams again. Are you, is Bradley going to bet against the Jets again? Good, good idea. Good idea. I got to make up ground somehow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to head into the fun half. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you there. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority on Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. On Matt! Who? Fun. What is up, everyone? Fun. No, Mickey. You did it! Fun. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, dude, uh, you want to smoke this... Uh, Yes. Yes. Is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go start off. Who libertarians? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him! So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge men. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 3501 One half. 38. 9 11, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. 654 